All right. How much more time, guys? What do you think? It is... I, believe, I believe we should start get started. OK. I want to welcome everyone tonight uh, to our uh, meeting and our special guest. I'm going to introduce our um, board so that you know who we are from uh, the uh, Society of St. John Chrysostom Youngstown Warren chapter. Um, we have our vice president, Greg Ulrich. We have a, um, I'm the current president. We also have our former president, uh, I, I saw Socrates is on, and our treasurer is Rich Matusi. Our secretary is Ray Nakley, and we have chaplain father Boshko Stavjanovic. Uh, we also have uh, some of our, our, I see two of our, our uh, okay. Board members. Yeah, oh, no, they're, they're all here. Our uh, trustees. Trustees, thanks, Rich. It's one of those days. Um, Thomas Batten, who is our, also our Zoom host, which I'm so pleased and happy he can do that. Thank you so much. And we have uh, uh, Deacon Michael Stabila. And our other, uh, other one is Chris Brocious. Uh, we really appreciate all of them. They do a good job. With that, we're going to dispense with a usual business meeting because I know everybody's busy and I would like to get right to the uh, guest speaker. With that, I'm going to ask Father uh, Sean Conaboy to lead us in an opening prayer. Good evening. Welcome, Monsignor. Uh, join, joining me uh, behind me is our is pastoral council from the parish, so I will have to jump off early and, 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 and meet with them, but I'm glad to be here, and we're whether they know it or not, we're glad to be here uh, for we're glad now. Here. But, but please, uh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many gifts to us, especially the gift of salvation which your Son has won for us. We ask you to continue to pour out your blessings upon us, especially your Holy Spirit, the Spirit that leads us into all truth, that leads us that spirit that leads us into unity. We ask that as we continue to work for greater unity amongst the uh, amongst Christians, that that our churches may be committed and be strengthened in their commitment to unity. We thank you for this opportunity this evening to reflect on 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 the progress that has taken place. We ask you to bless our speaker, uh, and and we ask you to bless the the future work that that we commit to. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, Father, uh, uh, that's Father Sean Conaboy. He is the uh, diocesan, Diocese of Youngstown's ecumenical officer. So we're so glad to have him uh, on board. With that, I'm going to ask Rich Matusi, who is our secretary and actually jack of all trades when it comes to this society and has been around for quite a long time, a lot longer than me. I'm going to ask him to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Madam President. You're welcome. Uh, we are very blessed tonight to have the opportunity to hear someone who's been in the dialogue on the international level for, for a while, a seasoned veteran. And we're, we're looking to, we're looking forward, Monsignor, really to hear your, your presentation tonight. Uh, I would like to introduce you to our guest here tonight in our Zoom meeting, a little bit about Monsignor McPartland. Monsignor McPartland is a priest of the Archdiocese of Westminster in the United Kingdom and the Carl J. Professor, Peter Professor of Systematic Theology and Ecumenism at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. He was born in Newcastle upon Tyne and graduated from Cambridge in mathematics in 1978. Having studied philosophy and theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, he was ordained a priest by Cardinal Basil Hume in 1984. He gained his doctorate from Oxford and then served for four years in a London parish. After holding a postdoctoral research fellowship at St. Edmund's College, Cambridge from 1933, 1993 to 1995, he was appointed to the fa faculty of Heathrop College in the University of London, where he taught systematic ta theology for 10 years before coming to the Catholic University of America in 2005. 
He served for two years on the International Theological Commission, which is, I believe, connected to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and also a member of the International Commission for Theological Dialogue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church since 2005. He has participated in the International Anglican Roman Catholic Dialogue and Roman Catholic Methodist Dialogue. Monsignor McPartland is also a member of the North American Orthodox Catholic Theological Consultation from 2006 to 2000 present uh, to the present. And Father Radu, our friend from Duquesne, uh, who spoke last time to us, is also on that consultation. Monsignor McPartland was appointed as a papal chaplain by Pope Benedict XVI in 2008 and served as acting dean of the School of Theology and Religious Studies at Catholic University of America in 2014 to 2015. He has written at least two books. The first book is The Eucharist Makes the Church, Henri de Lubac and John Zizioulis in Dialogue. And the other book is called The Sa uh, Sacrament of Salvation, An Introduction to Eucharistic Ecclesiology. I can't say enough that we have such a high caliber speaker. And Jack Fiegel has spoken very highly of you, Monsignor. And we followed some of the things of the International Commission on the uh, internet over the years. So we welcome you here. We're blessed to have you. And without further ado, I give you Monsignor Paul McPartland. Thank you very much indeed, Richard, and thank you, Laurie, as well, for uh, the kind invitation to be with you tonight. It's really a delight to be with you, dear friends, and uh, I'm so grateful for your invitation uh, to talk about the progress that the International Roman Catholic Orthodox Dialogue uh, has achieved and where we actually stand at the moment. Let's start by acknowledging, of course, that this is a very tragic time for the dialogue right at this moment, with the appalling Russian invasion of Ukraine and the shocking death and destruction that's followed. But thankfully, in the midst of all of that, there has been some positive news with regard to the International Catholic Orthodox Dialogue. From the 16th to the 20th of May this year, the coordinating committee of the International Dialogue met in Crete after an enforced break of two years caused, of course, by COVID. And we actually made significant progress in our meeting this summer. We were, of course, acutely conscious of the terrible suffering in Ukraine, which was already several months old then. And the communique from the meeting said the following, Gravely concerned about the tragic war in Ukraine and the many victims and refugees, the members prayerfully invoked God's peace upon that country and its people. And I'm sure that same prayer is very much in our own hearts as we meet this evening. Jack Fiegel, of course, who is with us and I understand is your national president, asked me to give an update on the dialogue at Orientale Lumen in June of this year. And it was just shortly afterwards that Richard contacted me, uh, inviting me to give an update for the Society of St. John Chrysostom also. And it really is an enormous pleasure to do so. And with Richard's permission, and uh, I'm actually going to follow uh, quite closely the lines of what I said to Orientale Lumen earlier in the summer, just to get us up to speed, if you like. And I'm looking forward then very much to the discussion that we will have afterwards when we can unpack things further and take it in whatever direction you would like to, to explore. The strict business of the coordinating committee's meeting in May was clear and happily we accomplished it. As the communique says, and I quote again, the committee completed the revision of the draft text entitled Primacy and Synodality in the Second Millennium and Today to be presented to a plenary session of the Joint International Commission expected to take place in 2023. 
Well, in fact, the next plenary meeting has now been arranged to take place from May the 31st to June the 8th next year in Egypt as guests of the Patriarchate of Alexandria. And what I'd like to do this evening is really to let you know how we reach this point of preparing for another plenary meeting. And in particular, what the, to let you know what the dialogue has been doing since we completed the Chieti document in our last plenary meeting in 2016. That, of course, is our most recent agreed statement. But first of all, even before that, I'd like just to go back to the very start and briefly to recap the highlights, if you like, of the story up to Chieti. The formal international theological dialogue between Orthodox and Catholics, the so-called dialogue of truth, began in 1980, building upon the dialogue of charity, as it was rather beautifully called. The ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras and Pope Paul VI so memorably began in the 1960s. As I'm sure you know, they first met on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem in January of 1964. I mean, can you think of a more poignant place for leaders of a divided church to meet? And the Second Vatican Council's decree on ecumenism was promulgated later that same year, in November of 1964, making a very special mention of the relations between the Catholic Church and the Eastern Churches. And just the following year, on the penultimate day of the Council, on December the 7th, 1965, the mutual anathemas of 1054 were solemnly lifted, both in Rome and in Constantinople. And many messages, uh, visits, and meetings followed. And on the 10th anniversary of the lifting of the anathemas in 1975, when Pope Paul VI famously knelt to kiss the feet of the delegate of the ecumenical patriarch, it was now Demetrios, uh, the successor of Athenagoras in Rome, it was announced at that point in 1975 that commissions were now going to start to prepare the theological dialogue between the two churches. And so, as I said, the first formal meeting of that theological dialogue took place in Patmos and Rhodes in the summer of 1980. And on the 1st of June in 1980, the Commission formally adopted what was called a plan to set underway the theological dialogue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. And that plan very wisely said, and I quote, that the dialogue should begin with the elements which unite the Orthodox and Roman Catholic Churches. And they specified this in no way means that it's desirable or even possible to avoid the problems which still divide the two churches. It only means that the dialogue should begin in a positive spirit and that this spirit should prevail when treating the problems which have accumulated during a separation lasting many centuries. Well, statements on the Eucharist, the Church and the Trinity, 1982, Faith, Sacraments and Ecclesial Unity, 1987, and Ordination, Apostolic Succession and Sanctification, 1988, all followed very swiftly as a blessed and positive reminder of just how much we share. There was a reason, I think, for that uh, sequence of topics the 1980 plan said at the very outset, and I quote, the purpose of the dialogue between the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church is the re-establishment of full communion between these two churches. This communion, it said, based on unity of faith, and we might note that phrase, based on unity of faith, according to the common experience and tradition of the early church, will find its expression in the common celebration of the Holy Eucharist, end of quote. And so basically, of course, we want to celebrate the Eucharist together again. That will be the sign and the seal of our full communion. That's what full communion actually means. If we're to do that, 
First of all, we must agree, obviously, on what the Eucharist itself actually is. And that was the purpose of the first statement in 1982. And then there are various conditions that are necessary for participation in the Eucharist, especially baptism and unity in faith. There's that phrase again. And the second statement of 1987 dealt with those topics. And then also, of course, the celebration of the Eucharist requires uh, ministers, bishops and priests properly ordained in apostolic succession. And so the third statement of 1988 considered those matters. Now, you might say that the proper celebration of the Eucharist by the bishop and his presbyters in each local church actually requires two kinds of communion, vertical and horizontal, so to speak. Apostolic succession expresses the communion of the bishops vertically, as it were, through history. That bond has got to be clear and, and uh, established properly. And synodality, of course, a very, very much a buzzword in the Catholic Church at the moment, and a vital uh, word for the Christian East as well from uh, time immemorial. Synodality, or what Catholics would normally call collegiality, expresses the communion of bishops horizontally across the world today, if you like. And so a fourth document was planned dealing with that final point, almost like the final piece of the jigsaw, you might say. The whole of that preparatory uh, process was focused on preparing the ground for us to celebrate the Eucharist together again. And a draft of that fourth document was prepared in 1990 as Eastern Europe was opening up after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the collapse of communism. That opening, as you know, led to a resurgence of life among the Catholic Eastern churches, many of which had been brutally repressed under communism. And the so-called issue, issue of uniatism, the fact that there are such Eastern Catholic churches and the methods by which they were formed, raised its head again. And as you know very well, the Eastern Orthodox churches have always objected to uniatism. And they insisted at that point that that very issue go to the very top of the dialogue's agenda. And a statement on uniatism, firmly calling it the method of union of the past and contrasting it with the present search for full communion, as they said, was agreed at Balamand in 1993, but even that really didn't clear the air. And a very unproductive meeting was held at Baltimore in 2000. And then the dialogue really ground to a complete halt. Happily, it resumed in 2005 with two new co-presidents, that was Cardinal Walter Casper and Metropolitan John Zizulis, and many new members. And that's actually when I myself joined the dialogue and dear Metropolitan Kalistos Ware of blessed memory also joined the dialogue at that point. And we had known each other for many years past uh, from Oxford days, in fact, when I was a student there doing my doctorate. Uh, and so the dialogue resumed in, nine, in 2005 with a very much reconstituted commission, largely because of some significant gestures of charity uh, made by Pope John Paul in those intervening years, just before his own death, of course. When we resumed in 2005, that 1990 draft was taken up again and duly revised. It became the very important Ravenna document of 2007 on communion and conciliarity and authority in the church. And ever since this dialogue began, it has been very concerned to clarify what the church's communion life should actually look like. The Ravenna document actually said, how do institutional elements of the church visibly express and serve the mystery of koinonia, communion? And to answer, it distinguished three levels in the life of the church, the local level, the regional level, and the universal level. And it said that the history and tradition of the church shows that at each of those levels, the communion life or synodality, 
that's characteristic of the church has had a focal point in one who is first, the protos or the head, kephale. And that, of course, is where primacy comes from. It's being the first at the local, the regional or the universal level. And ultimately, I might say, it's about uh, presiding at the Eucharist celebrated at those different levels. Uh, primacy means that being first and especially being first liturgically. The bishop is the first or head among his people in the local church. The metropolitan or patriarch is the first or head among the neighboring bishops at the regional level of the church's life. And, said Ravenna, there has always been and ought to be a first or a head at the universal level among the metropolitans and patriarchs. Two important statements from Ravenna. First of all, primacy at all levels in the church is a practice firmly grounded in the canonical tradition of the church, it said. And secondly, it must, however, never be forgotten that primacy and conciliarity or synodality are mutually interdependent. The fourth century uh, Apostolic Canon 34 is particularly important for expressing that interdependence of primacy and synodality, especially at the regional level in the church's life. And so those two affirmations that there is primacy at all levels, but primacy and conciliarity are mutually interdependent were really crucial achievements of the Ravenna document. And the Chieti document reiterated them together with the idea of there being three levels in the church's life, local, regional and universal. It was very important to reiterate those points at Chieti in 2016 because the Russian delegates left the Ravenna document and Moscow therefore never accepted the Ravenna document. Russian Orthodox delegates were present at Kieti and so when we recapped, if you like, those essential uh, statements from Ravenna, the Russians were now on board with those statements and a common basis, if you like, was again established. Kieti said, and I quote, Christian tradition makes it clear that within the synodal life of the church at various levels, a bishop has been acknowledged as the first. And it refers to synodality and primacy as interrelated, complementary and inseparable. However, it says, different understandings of synodality and primacy played a significant role in the divisions between Orthodox and Catholics. And that's why it's essential now to try, to try and establish what it called a common understanding of those realities. And that's exactly what the Chieti document then tries to do, looking at the first millennium and particularly focusing on the universal level, which, of course, is where the main problems lie. It's important, I think, to say straight away that, of course, there is full agreement between us that there's only one candidate for the office of universal primate, namely, of course, the Bishop of Rome. Ravenna and Chieti both recognize that Rome has always been first in the listing or taxes of the major sees that took shape between the fourth and the seventh centuries. That listing, as you know, was Rome in first place, then Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch and Jerusalem in that order. And Chieti reproduces all the relevant canons in a long footnote. Rome, it says, exercised a primacy of honor, recalling a phrase used by the Council of Constantinople in 381. And the Ravenna document quoted the famous words of Ignatius of Antioch, often recalled, in fact, by Pope Francis in recent times, that the local church of Rome presides in charity, presides in love. And it ended, that's the Ravenna document, by saying that what was needed was for the role of the Bishop of Rome in the communion of all the churches to be studied in greater depth. What is the specific function, it said, of the Bishop of the First See in an ecclesiology of koinonia? And in view of what we have said, this is at Ravenna, on conciliarity and primacy in the present text. And how should the teaching of the First and Second Vatican Councils on the universal primacy 
be understood and lived in the light of the ecclesial practice of the first millennium. That's a very important phrase. Those questions, said Ravenna, are absolutely crucial for our dialogue and for our hopes of restoring full communion now between us. And especially with uh, that reference to the ecclesial practice of the first millennium in mind, I would like just to note that the um, in 1976 at Graz and in 2001 in his uh, correspondence with Metropolitan Damaskinos, Cardinal Ratzinger, very momentously, I always think, specifically said that those first millennium titles about the Bishop of Rome having a primacy of honor and the Church of Rome presiding in charity could suffice from a Catholic perspective to express the unique role of the Bishop of Rome as universal primate without stressing the idea of universal jurisdiction which he says is a second millennium idea, and we should be, be quite happy to content ourselves with the phraseology that was used in the first millennium, which of course is the era that we look to as we now try and restore communion between us. So perhaps we'll come back to that afterwards if, if you would like to, but those statements of Cardinal Ratzinger always seem to me really momentous, momentous. The way forward after Ravenna was pretty clear. We needed to reconsider, uh, to consider rather, the ecclesial practice of the first millennium. What exactly did presiding in charity mean? Well, Chieti, then tackling that first millennium, tried to give at least the start of an answer. And then also, of course, we needed to look at the second millennium in due course, with particular attention to the first and second Vatican councils. Hence, the document we just agreed on this May in Crete. That's where we are now, looking at the second millennium and uh, trying to examine that rather tortured history between East and West together and peacefully. That document that we have just signed off on as the coordinating committee, now to move forward to a plenary discussion, does far more than just look at Vatican I and Vatican II. The second millennium, of course, was tragically an era of growing estrangement between Christian East and West, with both sides telling different stories of one another, often tainted by misunderstanding and polemic, and so it's very important to try and tell the story of that period peacefully together as far as possible. And that is actually our stated purpose in the new document, to try and offer a common reading of the second millennium, explaining ourselves to one another along the way and trying to draw some lessons from that period. The document, of course, as, as, as you understand perfectly, is, is confidential until such time as a plenary of the dialogue actually approves it, as we hope uh, might happen next summer in uh, Alexandria. And so, of course, I can't really go into detail about its contents, but I can, of course, give an indication of its basic purpose and outlook, and I'm more than happy to do so. It's a very constructive document, I think, which honors the directive of the 1980 plan that the dialogue should begin in a positive spirit, as we heard, and that that spirit should prevail when treating the problems that have accumulated in our long separation. The new document is the result of five years work, or I suppose really three years work, with an enforced delay then of two years. And interestingly, and I must mention this also, there is another document that's waiting in the wings, so to speak. And so, you know, how, come, how does it come about that we've actually got two documents on the go at the moment? Well, we need to backtrack just a little. In September of 2017, the coordinating committee met on the island of Leros, not very far from Patmos, to consider the way forward after the Chieti document, Chieti 2016. We met in 2017, where do we go now? And we began by reconsidering that 1980 plan. 
You remember that the plan said that the goal was the re-establishment of full communion between Catholics and Orthodox based on unity of faith. And I highlighted that phrase earlier on, according to the common experience and tradition of the early church. Well, the Leros meeting decided, in fact, that the topic for the next stage of the dialogue should be towards unity in faith, theological and canonical issues. And a subcommission to work on that was set up. And I was actually uh, appointed as the Catholic co-chair of the subcommission and Metropolitan Gennadios of Sassima, also recently deceased, may God rest his soul, uh, was the Orthodox uh, co-chair of that subcommission. So the intention really of that enterprise was to identify and treat all the other issues that might be out there with regard to Catholic Orthodox reconciliation. You know, it's one thing to say that we need unity and faith so as to share the Eucharist again, but it's quite another thing actually to name the issues. Okay, so what are the issues that prevent or impede or give rise to any concern about unity and faith? Obviously, some of them pertain precisely to primacy and synodality in the second millennium. So Leros decided that we would establish a second subcommission to work on that topic, primacy and synodality in the second millennium, following on from Chieti, which dealt with the first millennium. And so, in fact, we left that meeting at Leros in 2017 with a very strong sense of purpose and two projects running side by side, which is something that the international dialogue has never done before. The classical methodology of the dialogue has, in fact, been to identify a topic that we wanted to work on and then to establish two different subcommissions to work on the same topic in different languages. And the coordinating committee ultimately decided how to integrate the two resulting reports into one document that would be considered then by the plenary. That was the method adopted immediately after Ravenna. The two, uh, two subcommissions, one working in English and one working in French, were set up to consider primacy and synodality in the first millennium. And actually, Metropolitan Callistos and I were the co-chairs of the English language subcommission. And that was, of course, a delight to work with Metropolitan Callistos and the others on that subcommission. We really had a, a, a splendid time working together. The coordinating committee subsequently integrated the two reports, the English language one and the French language one, into what we thought was a very fine document on the first millennium, but which unfortunately failed to gain approval at the Vienna plenary, which was held in 2010, because of opposition from some on the orthodox side. And it should be noted, therefore, <laughs> that there are actually some significant documents from back then, not least, I may say, that English language subcommission report, that have never seen the light of day. They're just kind of archived on the part of the dialogue. It was only after another unsuccessful plenary in Amman in Jordan in 2014 with a very different kind of document that we finally succeeded in producing a text on the first millennium at Chieti. It was third time lucky, if you like. And if we hadn't achieved, if we hadn't succeeded in Chieti, we would have been in terrible problems. So, as I said, we moved on from Chieti and Leros with two concurrent projects, one broadly on the remaining theological and canonical issues, and one specifically on primacy and synodality in the second millennium. Both subcommissions got to work very quickly. We held drafting meetings in Rome in December of 2017, and we met again in the summer of 2018 to finalize our respective documents. And they were both ready for consideration by the coordinating committee of the dialogue at the monastery of Bose in Northern Italy in November of 2018. That was a very crucial time, as you will recall, in Orthodox Church affairs. As was bound to happen, 
uh, at some stage, having two concurrent projects, we sooner or later had to decide which of those two documents to take first. And for perfectly understandable reasons, the primacy and synodality document was given priority. Further work was done to refine it in the summer of 2019 and also in the fall of 2019, again at Bose. And then, of course, COVID struck. A plenary meeting of the dialogue can only really, I mean, being real, realistic, a plenary meeting can only handle one document at a time. And so we're now planning to take that document on primacy and synodality in the second millennium to the plenary meeting in Alexandria next summer. And as I say, we have another fine document just waiting for consideration in due course. I would note, and this is what I was saying about the fall of 2018, that Russian delegates were involved in both of the subcommissions that produced those two documents that are now waiting for consideration. It was in the fall of 2018, shortly before the coordinating committee met in November, that the Russian Orthodox Church broke communion with Constantinople. Uh, over the establishment of the autocephalous Orthodox Church of Ukraine and withdrew from all activities that were led by Constantinople, including, of course, the international dialogue. And so it was at that stage that the Russian delegates withdrew from the dialogue, from the subcommissions, from all of our activities. Well, you might ask, what is in that other document I keep referring to? the one that's just waiting for consideration in due course. Well, if we go back one last time to the 1980 plan, it gives us some pointers, I think. And this is what we ourselves decided at that meeting in Leros in 2017. The plan said that it was mapping out an agenda for the first stage of the dialogue. And it expressly took the sacrament of the Eucharist as its point of departure. It identified a whole range of issues connected with an, a sacramental understanding of the church centered on the Eucharist that needed attention. And frankly, many of those issues have now been covered in the various agreed statements. However, the plan also mentioned what it called some fundamental questions that had a bearing on the entire discussion of the theme of the sacraments, as it said. One was the relationship of the church and the sacraments, not just to Christ, but also to the Holy Spirit. How is the Holy Spirit involved in the life of the church and the sacraments of the church? Another was the possible tension between a historical approach to these topics in the West and an eschatological approach in the East. And there was finally what it called the anthropological question. Namely, how to understand the new creation brought about by the sacraments and the transformation of the natural and social and cosmic milieu of mankind. And so, if you like, already from that 1980 plan, there was the issue of the Holy Spirit, the issue of history and eschatology, and the issue of anthropology. These were the identified related questions, if you like. And the other document, the one I'm, uh, I've been referring to as dealing with, you know, the other issues to, uh, so that we can establish unity in faith, ventures precisely into those areas. It considers issues like original sin, purgatory, theosis, the development of doctrine, and of course, the filioque. So it's looking at um, anthropological issues, ecclesiological issues other than primacy and synodality, because there's far more to be said about the church than just that. And also of the sun is communicated to us, particularly in the Eucharist, by this son, 
upon whom he reposes in time and in eternity, end of quote. <laughs> I often think, looking at that quote from the 1982 document by the International Dialogue, whether anything further actually needs to be said about the filioque. That seems to cover all the bases. Anyway, in brief, therefore, that is we're up to speed now. <laughs> That's where the international dialogue stands at present. We hope that we might be able to agree that document on primacy and synodality in the second millennium and today when we meet in Alexandria next year. And there is that other very significant document ready to consider after that, which really aims to treat, as I said, all the other significant remaining issues that have a bearing on the unity of faith that we need to establish between us if we're going to have Eucharistic communion between Orthodox and Catholics. So in terms purely of texts, if you like, and tackling doctrinal and theological issues, it seems to me that the dialogue has made pretty good progress. However, <laughs> and it's a big however, no dialogue exists in the abstract. Theological dialogue, we might say, is certainly necessary for the reconciliation of Catholics and Orthodox, but it is by no means sufficient. Ultimately, it's churches, communities of faith, that need to find reconciliation and need to want reconciliation, not just their bishops and theologians. It's got to well up from the faithful in the churches. And the results of theological dialogue need to be received by the faithful in the churches. And an ongoing and ever deepening dialogue of charity between Orthodox and Catholics is also a sine qua non, undergirding everything you might say, together with lots of prayer on both sides for the gift of unity. All of that is necessary uh, above and beyond simply theological dialogue if we're going to have any prospect of reaching the blessed day when we receive Holy Communion together again. Charity absolutely has to be the foundation of our search for unity. And charity, of course, is the first precept of Christianity. It's a dogmatic uh, subject. It's not just a sort of pastoral attitude, if you like. The Lord himself said, love one another as I have loved you. That's the very first <laughs> precept, dogmatically, of Christianity. And I'd like to close just these uh, reflections uh, this evening with a couple of quotations from ecumenical pioneers, one Catholic and one Orthodox, who, it seems to me, express that profound truth of the importance of charity in very compelling ways. Um, the first one is Father Paul Couturier, uh, the pioneer of what's often called spiritual ecumenism, the founder, of course, of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity in France in the 1930s, in Lyon uh, specifically. He was drawn into ecumenism through working with Russian refugees in France in the 1920s. And he really does not have many writings above and beyond his immense corpus of letters. But in terms of a, a formal piece of writing other than letters, there's really only one uh, item from him. But it is an absolutely remarkable document. It's often called his spiritual testament. And in that spiritual testament, uh, Paul Couturier said this, and I quote, God cannot first bring about unity of minds in the truth and afterwards union of hearts in charity. Psychologically and in practice, he said, the reverse is the case. If we say that unity of faith must be established before anything else, so that the bond of charity may emerge from it afterwards, we are victims of abstraction, he said. <laughs> Very telling quote, I think. 
And the second quote, a rather longer one, is from Father Nicholas Afanasia, one of the outstanding Russian emigre theologians who finally settled in Paris, and a pioneer of the Eucharistic ecclesiology that has been the framework for the theological dialogue, the international dialogue, all along. Afanasiev actually attended the final session of Vatican II uh, as an ecumenical observer. And a couple of years earlier, in 1963, he wrote an article entitled Una Sancta, and he dedicated it to Pope John XXIII, who had just died in 1963. Afanasiev called him, with great affection and respect, the Pope of Love. And I'd like to close with some of Afanasiev's very moving words in that article about the power of love, the power of charity, especially between Orthodox and Catholics, because that's the context that he was writing in. Here's the quotation. Very often, he said, the loss of dogmatic truth is the result of love growing cold. One cannot re-establish the truth of dogmatic doctrine for the others without having re-established in oneself the truth of love in Christ. When love has once again become the foundation of life in all the churches, then dogmatic divergences that seem insurmountable will be removed in the light of this love. Christian people have placed knowledge above love because they have forgotten that our knowledge is imperfect and our prophesying is imperfect, as Paul says in the first letter to the Corinthians. When love is raised higher than knowledge, says Afanasia, then knowledge itself will be perfected. Knowledge is not opposed to love and love does not exclude knowledge. And when each Christian and all Christians together have come to understand that love is above division and that division is a sin before God, then the truth of love trampled underfoot will be reestablished. And through love and its power, the truth of dogma will be restored as well. End of quote. I often think that we would do well to remember what those two very wise and holy men say to us about the importance of charity. Thank you. I'll close there for the moment and um, look forward very much to our discussion, any points you would like to raise, any observations, and um, over to you. Thank you. Anyone have questions or comments? Please just join in. On Senior McPartland, I was wondering uh, when you meet in Alexandria, Egypt in 2023, could you explain to us? if it is acceptable in the plenary session, how it goes back to the other churches to be confirmed or validated in some sense? This, this is a great point, Richard. Thank you. The, um, the, I ought to explain that the, the, what are the sort of dimensions that we're talking about? The, the plenary commission consists of two delegates from each of the autocephalous Orthodox churches. So of course, until now that's been 14, which means 28 delegates. And then the Catholic side appoints 28 delegates to, to, to balance. But of course the Catholic side is if you like one delegation of 28 people, whereas the Orthodox side is like 14 or possibly 15 now, um, mini delegations of two. And the, um, it is, and, and I ought to say then that this coordinating committee I've been referring to is, of course, a smaller body, which kind of deals with matters in between plenary meetings. And so the coordinating committee consists of about 
eight or nine from each side. So we're talking about 15, 20 people um, in the coordinating committee. But um, it's the plenary committee that is the commission that's in charge of the dialogue. And, um, and so, um, you know, we will discuss the, the document and like we did at Ravenna and Kieti. And of course, if we come to agreement around the table there, that in itself is always something to celebrate. I remember uh, vividly how we how we all applauded and had an immense sense of joy in Ravenna in 2007 and in Kieti in 2016 when we had agreed around the table. But as you rightly say, that's not the end of the story because the document then really has to be taken back to the respective churches. And the Orthodox always, um, you know, take this document back all those to all of the different autocephalous churches. And so really the, the document of itself has no status, even if we all agree around the table at the plenary, um, until it is ratified by the different church bodies. And um, the different Orthodox churches have their own procedures. Often the document would be taken back and considered by the Holy Synod in those uh, different churches in various different ways. Uh, the Catholic Church, what do we do? Well, it, it, it's not terribly clear, actually. Um, it, it, it's taken back to Rome, and of course it's shared with the, the, um, the dicastery, as we must now say, for the doctrine of the faith, the DDF, not the CDF. And, um, and you know, obviously it, it's, it's, it's shared around and, and people get to know it. Um, there isn't really a formal process of ratifying on the Catholic side. There would be more possibility of a formal ratification among the, the Orthodox churches. But um, I think what you would say really is that, you know, uh, what the plenary does and if and when the plenary reaches agreement, that's the beginning of a process. It's not the end of a process. And really the documents then have got to be received and they've got to be talked about, they've got to be discussed, they've, you know, all sorts has got to happen so that they really enter the bloodstream of both sides and hopefully promote better relations. Um, I like that image of entering into the bloodstream or the consciousness of both sides. It seems like the whole process itself is an exercise in synodality accompaniment and walking together it is really you know i mean that that in itself of course is the basic you know matrix of the church's life and and we 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 walk together and the church is a communion and it's communion that has been tragically fractured between east and west and you know we're trying to repair that communion and and this of course is why charity is at the very basis of everything because Charity is the fundamental bond of communion. And, um, you know, faith, I would say, and I think <laughs> Couturier and Afanasiev would say, you know, the bond of faith actually is within the bond of charity. Um, Please, someone else. Thank you. Uh, Monsignor. Mon Monsignor, this is, this is Steve. I was wondering if you could... Um, say a few words about the, um, the participation role or whatever you would want to characterize it of the other autocephalous churches, those are, that are Catholic and in union with Rome. Um, and obviously originally, you know, they had no role at all in these dialogues, but I understand that it's been evolving over time. And do you have any comments on that uh, thank you very much Steve. this is a very important question of course the, these in other words the, the catholic eastern churches the the um they are very much part of the dialogue and always have been in certainly since um 2005 when when i joined the dialogue so um you know the it 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 is very natural and very important to to have them there and um, you know they fully participate, and in my time, you know that has that has simply been 
taken for for, for granted, you know, that and, and therefore um, there may well have been, I'm, I'm sure there must have been, um, you know, discussion about that at the very start of the dialogue back in 1980. Um, and I don't really know the, any of the, the, the details on that. But as far as I'm aware, the Catholic Eastern churches have, have, have participated from the outset. In fact, one of the one of the veterans of the dialogue is Monsignor Eleuterio Fortino, um, who uh, was, um, I think, he was the number three actually in the in the uh, Pontifical Council and a, a very long-standing um, Eastern Catholic member of the dialogue himself, and a much loved man who sadly died a few years ago now, but, you know, Monsignor Fortino was always a, a fundamental kind of reference point. And, uh, and so, yes, the dialogue has several members on the Catholic side from the Catholic Eastern churches, and that is very well established and, and not, um, not controversial in my experience. And this new um, documents that you'll be considering, uh, are they going to, uh, are they attempting to make any inroads into the status of the autocephalous uh, Uniate churches as, as part of your second millennium discussion? No, the, the, um, the way in which those, uh, the, you know, it came to be that there are Catholic Eastern churches is, of course, something that is, um, is, is covered in that document. You know, what's the story? What's the story? And of course, the, the Eastern Catholic churches all have different stories. This is a very important uh, point to make. You know, it's not just one size fits all. I mean, there are different reasons and different histories in all of those different churches. And so that story needs to be told. Um, I think, you know, it's recognized that, um, well, it, to take, if you like, the quote from Balamand in 1993, that, you know, the, the, obviously the story of the Eastern Catholic churches is a kind of piecemeal story. And, you know, looking forward, we, we, we want to move beyond any piecemeal solutions into the overall um, communion, please God, of, of East and West. So, you know, it's certainly not a sort of continuation of the, the, the methodology that led to the Eastern Catholic churches. Uh, we've, we've, if you like, um, you know, definitely put that methodology to one side. We're not looking at any piecemeal progress. We're looking at the totality. But very important in the midst of that is that the Catholic Eastern churches themselves are not to be set aside. Their own history and dignity is, you know, must be respected. And they are absolutely entitled to, 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 to continue and to, to, to be respected. Of course, in some future scenario, um, presumably the Eastern Catholic churches themselves would want to see, well, how are we now positioned if East and West do reach an overall communion, you know? And I know, for instance, a number of, um, I remember speaking to, to uh, one particular um, uh, Eastern Catholic who said, you know, basically, I consider myself an Orthodox who is in communion with Rome. Um, you know, that, that's my kind of self-perception. And so if it happened to be the case that, you know, the, the the Eastern Church as a whole was 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 once again in communion with Rome. You know, I would naturally, if you like, rejoin my Orthodox brothers and sisters, and because we'd all be in communion with Rome then. You know, and so obviously the actual working out of that would would take a whole multitude of forms according to individual circumstances. So um, I think that's that's uh, those are the. I think the main things I would say does that does that sort of answer your question, Steve? Yeah, it's 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 getting toward it. I th I think uh, you're putting the finger on the the thing that I'm trying to see how far apart things are. I mean, obviously, the 
uh, I guess the follow up on that is how does the situation between Moscow and Constantinople uh, complicate you know, that process, especially in, in Eastern Europe? Well, uh, it, 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 it complicates it horribly, of course, the, you know, the, the, um, I mean, the, the, it ought to be said, you know, I mean, you might think, well, you know, how on earth is the dialogue able just to try and continue with normal business like this summer when we met in Crete? The Orthodox for a long time have had a protocol because there are a number of Orthodox churches that if any church or group of churches even um, absented itself from a meeting of the dialogue, the dialogue would still continue. In other words, you know, uh, if certain Orthodox churches were not present, that wouldn't ipso facto mean that the meeting couldn't take place. The dialogue had to be suspended. Uh -huh. you know? Whoever turned up was going to take part in the dialogue. And so, um, so of course, that's being that's being <laughs> invoked in a in a very uh, um, dramatic way at the moment because the biggest of all the Orthodox churches, namely the Russian Church, is is not present. But the other churches, and certainly Constantinople, are absolutely adamant that we have this understanding, we have this protocol. The dialogue continues. They have broken communion with us. We have not broken communion with them. And so if they choose to be absent, well, that's their decision. And so, you know, the dialogue continues. But I mean, for all sorts of obvious reasons, I mean, you know, we, we hope and pray for an end, well, first and foremost, to the ghastly um, bloodshed and misery in Ukraine, which is, you know, just totally, totally horrendous. And uh, and then just for you know for peace in the church and 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 uh, surely you know I mean in the twentieth century it's worth noting I think that you know what gave the ecumenic the whole ecumenical movement a great impetus in the twentieth century was um, two successive world wars you know which caused the Christ the divided Christian churches a real kind of heart searching to say you know. Have we so failed to, to preach the gospel of peace and reconciliation that after 2000 years, the world can still tear itself apart like this, you know? And then they say, well, look at our own witness. We ourselves are divided, you know, how, how this is indefensible. The world needs our unity. Our division is a luxury that we, we should be ashamed of, you know? And so I think here again, we're, we're facing that same question you know the church has to has to be in the lead in in peacemaking and and you know bringing god's peace to the world because it's perfectly plain how the world can tear itself apart given half a chance and senior um oh. Hi, Megan. Okay, sorry, I had to turn the mic towards me. <laughs> um, so I actually just have a clarifying question because I was taking notes and I wasn't taking them fast enough. <laughs> so um, there was a point at which um, you were talking about um, the fundamental questions on the themes of the sacraments um, were uh, historical approach in the West, Eschatological, eschatological approach to the East, mm. um, anthropology. But I, I have that you have a document considering one, the development of doctrine or ecclesiology to the filioque, and then a third point that I, I didn't. Yes, uh, this, this is that kind of catch-all other document, Megan. That's yes, got a whole a whole bundle of stuff in it. It's okay. got um, anthropological questions like mm -hmm. original sin and theosis and so on. Mm -hmm. It's got ecclesiological things like the development mm -hmm. of doctrine and, um, you know, uh, various other uh, questions in, in, in ecclesiology. And also um, the filioque is in it okay. as well. So it's a 
It's a kind of um, catch-all document with with okay. lots of things in it. Yeah. Great. So ecclesiology, filioque, and anthropology. If I were to put it succinctly. Yeah. Okay. Those, Great. those would be the the main sort of headings, if you like. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, and thank you so much for this um, very personal um, perspective on the. It, it just is a reminder that these dialogues don't just happen in abstraction, as you say, they're, they're between people and they're an actual literal dialogue <laughs> around a table between people um, to accomplish uh, something that should hopefully benefit literally billions. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yes, I, 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 I would certainly reinforce that, that, you know, it, it, there's nothing quite like the experience of dialogue <clears throat> because you know, you look one another in the eye and you you actually hear one another explaining themselves. And so, you know, it's important not just to uh, have an idea of what you think the others say, but actually to, to look them in the eye and say, you know, what exactly does this mean when you say such and such? And, um, you know, it, it's easier to point the finger when you're at a distance and just looking at you know, or just dealing with ideas when you actually meet flesh and blood people who, you know, who are wanting unity like you're wanting unity. The, the dynamic is just completely different. Thank you. Uh, can can you all hear me? Now we see you. All right. I want to thank uh, Monsignor McPartland, of course, for uh, a wonderful update and and, and presentation. And uh, Monsignor, I remember you were a participant. I believe you were there in person. It has to be ten, no, maybe fifteen years ago in Cleveland at the uh, Eastern Church's uh, Tradition Seminar. The subject there was the Eucharist, of which I believe you are also an authority. And uh, if, if you remember that meeting as I remember, your Orthodox uh, colleagues and counterparts went out of their way as you did, uh, as I remember, to say in front of the entire group, I am sure that the Eucharist you celebrate on your altar is as valid. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the very same way that we celebrate. So to me, you Eucharistic theologians, I mean, the people that uh, are, are patriarchs, bishops, and uh, you know, the whole, uh, uh, you know, the whole hierarchy of the church depends upon to know and explain and teach these things to, to our clergy coming up. You, you know, you and, and your colleagues were so open and so definitive about that, that communion apparently must exist, except for political reasons at the top. So if it's not a theological barrier, uh, and I and, and I know you did uh, indicate this and touch on this, and I hope, uh, Lori, we do end the meeting with our uh, our society's prayer, which also touches on many of the very issues that uh, Monsignor's brought up, most especially our lack of charity, which is a scandal, a scandal in this church. I mean the the uh, uh, Motto the the line the scriptural line that we go by in our local chapter of the Society of Saint John Chrysostom is uh, uh, what is it John seventeen uh, seventeen to twenty three where Jesus is in the garden sweating blood and asking talking with his father our father about the disunity among his own apostles. So this this problem that we're talking about apparently goes right back, right back to 
Christ himself and, and the 12 that he, that he selected. And uh, uh, it, it's human pride, first of the seven deadly sins, hubris, I think that are, are separating us. Because you theologians explain very, very explicitly that day in Cleveland that the Eucharist we have is the same Eucharist. And we're not sharing it for reasons that, I'm sorry, must be sinful. Thank, thank you very much for those uh, the, those lovely recollections, Ray. I, 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 I yes, I, I do remember that occasion, and I and I happily, um, you know, uh, repeat exactly what you were saying uh, there. You know, there's absolutely no doubt between Catholics and Orthodox that we celebrate the same Eucharist. And, um, you know, we fully recognize one another's Eucharist. It is said, and there is literature on this, that Pope Paul VI and Patriarch Athenagoras were intending to concelebrate once again in the late 1960s. And that this, um, this was sort of stopped at the last minute because this was just a step too far. Uh, if you like, you know, it would have been, it, so many people would have misunderstood. They, I, I think the Catholic, if, if I may say, you know, I, I, this isn't a sort of partisan point at all, but I do think that had that happened, the, 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 the Catholic faithful would, I think, have been carried along by what the Pope did, whereas I think Patriarch Athenagoras would have hit many more problems on the Orthodox side of those who, who would have thought this was way too big a step to make, you know, with, and, um, and so it, it didn't happen. But I mean, it's instructive to, to know that they were even thinking of that, you know, that's what they wanted to do. And that's, it's, it's what Pope Francis and Patriarch Bartholomew regularly reiterate nowadays, you know, that we, we long to celebrate the Eucharist together. And um, that, that's what it's all about. And I, and I do think that um, just as a, 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 a little uh, important point, that one of the, <clears throat> the, the, the most interesting developments in Catholic theology in, in recent decades has been the desire, and uh, Joseph Ratzinger has, has really been at the forefront of this, to see the papacy as a service to the Eucharist. And, you know, not to, because of course, you know, what, what puts people off the papacy, not just Orthodox, but of course, Protestants generally, is that they think it's just some, some sort of alien office of domination in the church that Jesus established based on love and centered on the sacrament of the Eucharist. And, you know, if you just have a very institutional and juridical understanding of papacy, then that rather reinforces the, the opposition that people have to it. But, you know, the, the, if you take, you know, Joseph Ratzinger, for instance, says, look at what Ignatius says, that the Church of Rome presides in charity. He said, charity, agape, was a, one of the names given to the Eucharist. And, you know, if the Eucharist is a bond of communion, then in the church, we need those who will be guardians of Eucharistic communion, if you like. And that's going to be a very essential office in a Eucharistic church. And so a, a, a significant body of, of, of reflection in which Ratzinger himself has been a very significant, uh, played a very significant part, has been precisely developing that point in recent years, that the papacy is a service to the Eucharistic unity of the church. And if you present the papacy in that light, you know, obviously the bishops take care of the Eucharist in their own locality. And, but then who's looking after the universal communion which comes from the Eucharist? Well, you know, the Pope as servant of the Eucharistic unity of the universal church, if you like, um, if you speak about the papacy in that way, linking it to the Eucharist, then all sorts of ecumenical doors open because, you know, especially between Catholics and Orthodox, because we recognize the Eucharist that we celebrate, we want to have Eucharistic unity, and if the Pope is, is presented as somebody who's basically at the service of Eucharistic unity, 
then, you know, discussion about his role becomes much more feasible than if he's just seen as some kind of, um, you know, governing figure at the top of a pyramidal church, which the Orthodox don't want anything to do with. Uh, one one other comment, uh, uh, another recollection, <clears throat> and Rich and, and some of the longtime members of uh, our Youngstown Warren chapter, our our patron, uh, uh, Bishop uh, Botine, John John Michael Botine, uh, very very reflective, very bold man in in many ways. He, he, we were addressing this issue, which of course is central to why we have the Society of St. Saint John Chrysostom. And uh, he said straight out, what I am, am working towards, or what we are working towards in unity, eventually I, I recognize will be the absolute disappearance of my church. Because if we're gonna have unity, how many Eastern Catholic jurisdictions that weren't pulled out of, of uh, what we now refer to as orthodoxy. I mean, if, if we're going to have true unity, what would be the purpose for the Romanian Eastern Catholic, Byzantine Catholic Church, and the Romanian Orthodox Church? Now, I, I happen to be a Maronite, so we don't have a counterpart. I, yeah. I joke say we. We, we, we killed them off uh, 1400 years ago. I, <laughs> but, uh, you know, for, for some reason of history, and as you said, each church is unique. Each church is different, yeah. Perhaps the Italo Albanians don't, don't uh, ha have a counterpart as well. But every other church, uh, that's where the term uniatism comes in. They were disunited uh, from uh, Constantinople and, 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 and attached to Rome. So I, I don't know. Do you have a. You have a comment uh, along along those lines. Would most of these churches, which you were just uh, mentioning, and and again, we're here, here in politics, would they logically, naturally, eventually have to disappear? Well, I, 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 and incidentally, I I mentioned Monsignor Fortino before, but he was precisely belonged to the Italo Albanian uh, Church, and um, I I I. I wouldn't want to say that they would have to disappear with the sort of imperative there. I think there might just be a natural process by which, you know, they would be um, um, reintegrated into, um, you know, the, 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 into the Eastern churches, except of course, in the, the unique cases that you mentioned, but, you know, the Eastern churches from which many of them came, um, there would seem to be something natural about that and uh, and of course you know the the, the vatican II rather um i mean it didn't specifically say that but it sort of looked in that direction because you know the uh, on the same day in 1964 the 21st of um november the um three documents came out lumen gentium on the church Unitatis Redintegratio, the decree on ecumenism, but also Orientalium Ecclesiarum on the Catholic Eastern churches. And that document uh, specifically said, you know, that all of these provisions for the Catholic Eastern churches, you know, uh, are in place until such time as, um, you know, communion will be restored, we please God, between East and West, and then, you know, um, obviously a different dynamic would take over then and and um the situation would be you know there, there would probably be this kind of realignment i think that, that would just be very natural uh when you think of it and so you know that document did specifically say these provisions are in place until such time as the greater communion please god is re-established when obviously circumstances will be very different and decisions would need to be be made and but again in good conscience there's no there's no forcing of anything here 
it's what would be natural and how would people find that they were you know living their their religious life in the way that they wanted to live it if i may say forgive me giving a um a a, a, a plug at this moment but it, when i mentioned that as, as you might have gathered, you know, I'm rather keen on this Eucharistic approach to primacy because I think it opens all sorts of doors. And it's been very remarkable as a development in recent times. But I wrote a little book a few years back. And if I can just sort of uh, show you it, it's called A Service of Love. And you see the subtitle, Pap Papal Primacy, the Eucharist and Church Unity. But it's um, it's. Uh, it was published by our Catholic University of America Press, but um, and I did a I did a postscript. Uh, it first came out in 2013, which of course is when Pope Francis was elected, and uh, and so a few years later, I there was a new edition with a postscript. You see, it says with a new postscript on the um, just taking account of Pope Francis because he he you know carried forward the same the same idea that was developed by um, his predecessors. So, um, so as I say, just, just in case you would like to read, you know, a little bit more, but I, I'll show you, it's just a thin book there. <laughs> it's not, it's not a 500 page monster. It's, uh, it's about 110 pages, I think. So, um, but it's about, it's precisely about the potential of the Eucharist, if you like, to give us a helpful uh, avenue uh, along which to seek uh, a solution to universal primacy. Well, uh, speaking of plugs of books, uh, once again, uh, uh, our founder who's here tonight, uh, both of our founders, uh, Father Rohan and Dr. Richard Matusi, who wrote a book called The Ratzinger Formula. Yeah. First, uh, you know, uh, Pope Benedict, formerly Cardinal Ratzinger, several times tonight, and that 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 was the basis of uh, Rich's uh, doctoral thesis. Why can't we go back to the first thousand years, first millennium, and require no more of each church than we did then, um, as uh, a pathway towards. Uh, towards reconciliation and uh, and reunion. Anything you'd like to say about that, Rich? In fact, if you have a book, you should hold it up. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. <laughs> Thank you for the plug, my friend. Uh, Monsignor, Monsignor, Richard, it's apropos. Well, thank you. Monsignor gave us so much to think about, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just so blessed to hear this lecture again, and Jack and all the wonderful things he's done with the Orientale Lumen and our Great our, to see you, Jack. Our wonderful society here in Youngstown. Jack, Jack has given us, Monsignor, uh, how can I say this, a Byzantine imprimatur that we are allowed to function the way we do because he's guided us and we're probably the most active sister chapter in the world. So thank you, Jack, for that designation. You know, we're just continuing to listen to each other and dialogue. Uh, we love each other's food. It's a wonderful thing where we come together, we pray together, we eat together, we study together. We do debate. I don't think we argue. And uh, we, we, we move this along. And, you know, my, my dear friend, Father Rohan, we, we, we brought this labor of love here to fruition to some degree. And we have Monsignor with us tonight. And so it's just, it's just such a blessing. And, of course, Joseph Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger, Benedict XVI. I think has given us somewhat of a deep insight in the panoramic view of the church at times. And we have to digest that. So thank you, Ray, for mentioning that. And we we, we kept Monsignor McPartland a little bit over here, so we don't want to. That's true. Know, uh, uh, it's, that's fine. Are there any I'm other, I'm sorry, are there any other quick questions from Monsignor? Hey, Lori, Anthony here. Hi there, hi there, Anthony. Anthony. Hey, oh, I got my uh, uh, Lebanon. I see that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what the condition? The home of Khalil Gibran. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Anyway, um, 
Montina, just a quick question, uh, because I, you know, as a young man, I'm on the internet a lot, and I, I see the Western Rite Orthodox uh, Church, and uh, they have a draw in the West, in America, and in the UK. Can you explain if they have any effect, if they're harmful to this process of unity, if they can somehow be incorporated? Is it a diverse, uh, was it, um, are they being too, uh, let's say controversial? Uh, what, what's, uh, do you have any insight on the Western Rite or Latin Rite Orthodox Church? To, to be honest, I really don't know anything about them beyond the fact that they exist. And, and so I, I really wouldn't want to say anything um, because I, I just don't know them well enough, you know, to, uh, to comment, I'm afraid. So I'm, I'm not wriggling out. <laughs> I'm just saying that, that I, I, you know, it, it's, uh, it wouldn't be fair of me really to say anything because I, I just don't know them um, well enough. I mean, do, do, do you know them yourself, clearly? Uh, well, I don't know if Father Rohan knows this. I know many of the parishes are under the uh, Antiochian church, that they have some special, I mean, this is, of course, using a Catholic term, an ordinariate, just as you have the Anglican ordinariate, but in the Orthodox world. So they are a very small group. Of course, uh, I don't think they number more than a few thousand to tens of thousands, but it is something that, at least in online circles, I've noticed uh, some interest in among people who love the Western tradition, but are feeling uh, a bit of despair with uh, either the Catholics or the Anglican Church. So Father that's- Dan, Father Dan, could you speak to that? I have- Excuse the expression. I mean, I'm sorry, but I've been out of the picture because I'm retired. So I really don't know what's been happening since uh, with the with the that Western Church, the Orthodox Church. But I, what I do remember in the past was the the interest was they were following their liturgical traditions of the Western tradition, you know, that they grew up in. But they had they developed the the theology of the Orthodox Church and they integrated into their within their tradition. They wanted to keep their rights as they worshiped and so forth, uh, but they adopted the Orthodox liturgical understanding of the faith and they integrated it into their cycle of worship and prayer. But that was, but that's been a cultural thing over the over the centuries. When you think about it, when you go into the when the faith was spreading. And establishing the church, there were their cultural traditions, liturgical traditions be began to develop, but a focal point of worship was Eucharistic gathering, and and that was and that has kind of maintained itself within that right. I've been out of the out of this so to speak out of the picture now. What's going on? Because since I've retired, you know, and so but uh, I'm still keeping busy even though I'm retired because uh, there's. There's a need of priests to serve and help anywhere that I can, and so that's been a real, a real blessing. But I, I, I Father uh, Paul, I really enjoyed your presentation. It just brought back a lot of memories and updated my knowledge of things that I um, haven't heard for a while. And it's a blessing to see that the dialogues are going on. And I'm looking for the progress that this continues because the unity is there, the love is there. Our traditions, if they're combined together, will be even enriched even more in celebration. It's a culture thing that develops over over the over hundreds of years, and it continues to this day. And there might be some even even changes taking place liturgically. Who knows in the future? But the focal point of the theological understanding of faith will remain the same, Eucharist, Eucharistically united together. I in my heart, I feel. But it's good to see that we have this love and dialogue that's going on right now. It's 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 a real blessing to hear this from from you this evening. And thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Father. It's, it's it's lovely to hear your 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 own experience there as well. And and I I would just reaffirm that you know the Eucharist has has been from the beginning at the heart of this dialogue, and 
and I, in the um, there was a there's a very um, important statement I think made in the in the Kieti document. It, it's just a sentence, but it it just occurs to me as as you're speaking there, Father. It says. Um, Wherever it's talking about the taxes of the, the main seas, and it says, wherever two or no, it says this, there's three sentences. The taxes of the patriarchal seas had its highest expression in the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. Whenever two or more patriarchs gathered to celebrate the Eucharist, they would stand according to the taxes. And this practice manifested the Eucharistic character of their communion. And that, of course, implicitly means that since the Bishop of Rome is the first in the taxes, that as and when, please God, we, we, we find our communion once again and celebrate together, the Pope himself will naturally be the presider. And, and this takes me back to something I, I mentioned earlier on that, you know, really, if you have a liturgical understanding of the church, then having primacy in the church is fundamentally about presiding at the church's worship. So, you know, locally, the bishop presides over the liturgy of his local church. And, um, you know, regionally, who presides? The, the, the patriarch, the metropolitan, these different levels. But then at the universal level, you know, what does it mean to have somebody who's called the universal primate? It means that if, you know, the, 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 all the bishops were together, all patriarchs from a number of different places, who would preside at a Eucharist like that? The universal primate. And that really is what his primacy means with all that presiding at the Eucharist would imply for the relationship of, 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 of all the, the, uh, the different um, local churches um, at that sort of worldwide level, if you like, you know. Um, so I think linking primacy with Eucharistic presidency, if you like, is, um, is, is quite a helpful connection to make, I think. You know, it's also too, when I think when we worship Eucharistically, we're all together. Yes. You know, yes, there's a primacy and so forth, but when we come together, we're one family. Yes. And that, what's the beauty of worshiping the Eucharist is the presence of Christ in our lives. What are we living for? The foundation of true love has been given to us through Christ. And he wants to keep that unity together. How do we keep this love relationship going? It's celebrating with him. When we celebrate, he is with us. He's present with us. The heavenly presence is there. That's all we're looking for. That's what our life is all about. Our first love is to love Christ. And from that point on, he gives us the, the guidance and directs us and ministers us in, in certain ways so that his presence may be known in all aspects of our ministry for each other. So may the love of Christ continue to be with us as we celebrate the Eucharistic of our love for each other. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I know it's getting late for everyone and Monsignor, we really appreciate you. Are there any other quick questions so Monsignor can uh, rest tonight? Uh, again, Lori, I will volunteer to end the meeting with our. I uh, excuse uh, me, Ray. Prayer, unless you'd rather not, it's up to you. I, I was going to ask Father Rohan to uh, grace us with his prayer, if he would. Father Rohan, did you hear me? My request. I'm so sorry to put you on the spot. Always put me on the spot. <laughs>